Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I'm pleased to introduce our guests this evening. The Interim Director of New York's Leslie Lohman Museum of Art, Laura Rykovich, is a fierce advocate for museums to be hubs of activism and care that foster a more engaged and informed public. The former director of the Queens Museum, her 2018 resignation from that institution became one of the latest instances of politicized resignations amongst museum administrators across the US. A recipient of the Rockefeller Foundation Bellasio Fellowship, Reykjavik lectures internationally, has created and implemented new museum preservation strategies and is the author of the books At the Lightning Field and A Diary of Mysterious Difficulties. In her new book, Culture Strike, she offers context for historical and contemporary controversies, argues that ideological neutrality in museums is a myth, and outlines a plan for improving these institutions to better serve the public. Tonight, she'll be in conversation with Seth Rodney, opinions editor and managing editor of the Sunday edition for Hyperallergic, author of The Personalization of the Museum Visit, and winner of the 2020 Rapkin Arts Journalism Prize. It's great to have you both with us. The screen is yours. Thanks very much for that introduction. I think we can dispense with the frivolities and just get into it instead of hey, Laura. Absolutely, Seth. Okay, okay great. Great, fantastic. Uh, I'm gonna ask you a somewhat impertinent initial question. Mm -hmm. I hope that's okay. It's totally okay. Why is this book necessary, Culture Strike? Um, I think there's a massive struggle going on right now with what museums mean um, and what meaning they deliver to various publics. I think um, there are a lot of questions. I think everyone thinks that art is very powerful, um, but that the institutions um, that present the art are flawed, that maybe there are a number of people who question what meaning the art that's being presented in those institutions uh, conveys to the public and why it's being chosen and how and by whom, mm. but also what do these institutions say to regular folks, like, and how do they say it? Um, and are they delivering, if they're public institutions in a kind of um, broader sense, are they delivering what the public desires? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my, the, the, the question that I found, or, the, or I guess the issue that I got wrapped up in, in my mind and in my, out of my experience mm -hmm. was that there's this very significant piece of the museum mm -hmm. um, that is both trusted on one level as a source of information, as a source of uh, education, as a source of ideas that's deeply trusted, right? And then on the other hand, the museum seems to be controlled by a very narrow segment of the population, an, mm -hmm. uh, an elite, if you will, um, mm -hmm. a segment of the population that's of a certain race, of a certain class, of a certain uh, demographic. Mm. And, um, and that that wasn't necessarily servicing a wider public. And so there are these two kind of views of the museum that have to be negotiated all the time, right? Mm. Um, and so I wanted to write this book because I felt that I had some experiences being both inside the museum um, and uh, inside many different cultural institutions, including those that produce public art, um, as well as museums with collections, that gave me a perspective that I could share about both how those institutions function and also what I see as the dysfunctions of those places. Yeah. Um, and I think why right now? Well, you know, I started this project uh, three years ago, so it's been a, a while in the making, <laughs> you know, how books go. Um, and of course, you know, I submitted the first draft of this book, um, you know, in March of last year, mm -hmm. um, and then subsequently wrote an additional chapter with some reflections um, mm -hmm. on, on the last 18 months. Um, 
but I think that those urgencies that I came to this project with three years ago are pro probably magnified by what we've been through in the last 18 months, because I think that between social and racial justice protests um, and the COVID crisis um, and the economic crisis that's also ensued, I think that our divisions and our social and economic and um, and uh, environmental um, differences and the ways in which the world is dysfunctional is that much more, uh, th those differences are really, have been really heightened by the last 18 months. And so it feels like we're deeper into this, these questions. And I, I just, you know, I, I I think that we need different ways to look at the look at the problems, look at the challenges that we face as a larger society. And because I know the museum, and because I know that the museum and the cultural space so closely mirror the wealth inequities in society, the um, the social uh, the social dysfunctions of society, that my thought was, well, okay, if I can figure out how to make some headway, where if we can collectively figure out how to make some headway in our cultural universe, in our cultural institutions, maybe that's useful in the larger, in the larger space. But does it help you think that you have this kind of insider perspective and experience? I think it only helps insofar as, um, you know, I, uh, you know, th that I know some of the answers to the questions that are I think frequently asked at the outset, you know, like how does a board work? How does, what does it mean to be a museum director? What are you actually deciding about? You know, what does it mean to build a budget? Like what, it, what does the budget of a museum look like? Mm. Why, why is it so expensive to run? Mm. You know, mm. how much money do you spend on, you know, exhibitions or public programs or educational programs, like which is another way of basically asking you what your priorities are. Yeah, and so you know, I think exactly, um, exactly, exactly. Like we're well, and also there are things that you have to spend money on, whether you want to or not, and you know whether you know. I think um, you know every uh, business and nonprofit on in the United States should be, you know, um, at the at the doors of Congress every day fighting for um, single payer health care because of the insane increases in health insurance that get visited upon all of our budgets from year to year. I mean, there was a period of time when I worked at DIA where it was literally 18 to 20 percent increase year over year, year over year. Wow. And so, you know, the realities of that scale of crazy is just, you know, to something that is a human right that we should all have access to, like without question, is just daunting, you know, from a material aspect of like, I have to devote this sick amount of money in my budget every year to health insurance. And I want to do what's best for my team because everybody needs good health insurance. Right. And then, yeah. you know, you get hit with this private insurance company. So, you know, that is just like a tiny sliver of the reality, I think, that helps, you know, and, and then also just in terms of, um, you know, where my thinking comes from on, you know, the analysis piece. Mm -hmm. It's like, for example, you know, um, I think that, you know, in thinking about what we can do better. Mm -hmm. the kind of proposals for change mm. even just in the simple dumb things of like make sure that there is a friggin uh pay range on every job description that's mm. Mm. you know just there are some dumb like i i call them dumb ideas because they're mm. not like super special and brilliant and a million mm. people have had them but like mm. everybody can implement it mm -hmm. like those are no brainers just mm -hmm. do but it's mm -hmm. a question of getting inside of these systems mm -hmm. that are geared for a certain type of success, right? So it's like, you know, I actually have had conversations with previous human resources colleagues who said to me, 
well, that's just not done. It's not a best practice. Mm. It's like, well, let's look at what we're calling best practices then. Because mm-hmm. to me, it's a big waste of time to bring somebody in and have a million interviews. It's a waste of their time. It's a waste of our time. If there's no way they're going to be able to accept the salary range that we're imagining for this position. No, 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 that's right. And that actually shows a decent amount of respect to the person who is applying for the job who you may very much want on staff, but doesn't have the sort of resources that would allow them to be profligate with spending their time and attention and various funds for copying, whatever, um, Just the on, making, on making that application. So that's, right. that's, that's actually a very, I, I, the words is coming to mind is generous, but it's not actually, it's not even, it's, it's a tick below generous. It's just, it's just respectful. It's, it's just like, yeah, it's just basic. basic. Yeah, yeah, it's basically. That's basic. that's basic. Like, I'm not going to waste your time. Right. You know, uh, that goes hand in hand with saying that all of the salaries in museums need to be better. No, 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 that's, 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 that's exactly right. No, and they need to I mean, be, I don't mean to say like, you know, uh, it's okay to have a crap salary. No, 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 Don't no. have a crap salary, no, but no, no, no. if I, you have to have a meh salary, make sure you put it out there, right? right? Right, for sure. And I think people know that about you before even reading your book. Um, I want to get into some nitty gritty stuff. Let's do it. Because I, I read your book and you can see I, I, Love I it. highlighted some passages that were quite meaningful to me. I'm going to take a different tack. I, I did listen in to your talk with Aruna D'Souza and Ken Chen, and um, I'm blanking on the last person's name. Kelly, Kelly Morgan. Thank you. Um, the other week. And having had the experience of that, I want to take a very sort of granular approach to asking some questions about the book, which occurred to me. You say on page 24, and I'm going to quote, the Enlightenment period, quote, the Enlightenment period with its commitments to individualism, reason, and the separation of church and state is perhaps equal only to modernism in its impact on museums and cultural institutions. In fact, the Enlightenment idea of universal man and subsequent reification via modernism lies at the core of the emergence of the myth of neutrality in museums. Okay, so, you know, neutrality in museums is a central theme to your book. We know that. Um, we who have read the book. Um, but I want to get at this modernism thing. It's equal, you say that enlightenment, the enlightenment period is equal only to modernism and its impact on modern, on museums and cultural institutions. What is the impact that modernism has had on these museums and cultural institutions? What, how do you see, first of all, before, we, we should define our terms. Yes. Please tell us what you believe modernism to be and then how that's impacted our cultural institutions. Well, I think modernism, modernism in the context of my book is, um, I, I, I talk about modernism as, um, as, a, as a kind of container for um, a distilled, a distillation of capitalism and individualism in the modern period, right? Okay. Um, so in the sense of the reification of the individual, the, um, the confirmation of the genius, mm-hmm. particularly in the art context, the genius artist, the, um, the individual um, as the prime mover and shaker of society, right? Okay. Um, the, you know, um, so, so we, we can go through, let, let's get specific here because I think this is a really important aspect of both the book and, um, and, and my thinking just in general with what's wrong with society right now, but as reflected particularly in the museum. Mm-hmm. So, so let's talk about money, okay? Mm-hmm. Let's talk about money. So, um, you know, the individual donor, the major philanthropists, these are all like gifts seen as gifts Mm -hmm. to society right Mm -hmm. and in a sense you know it's us the public all of us who've given the right to the wealthy person to make the donation Mm. as opposed to 
there being a tax on their wealth, mm -hmm. which the public then through their elected officials gets mm. to determine what it's used for. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, my advocacy around the public mm -hmm. is to reclaim that aspect of our power, our collective power as mm -hmm. a public mm -hmm. to say, you no, know, we actually want some of that decision making power back. And if you look at the taxation rates, even just of the Reagan era, if we I know were, there was there were 35%. Yeah, if we were at those taxation rates, 33, 35. 33 to 35 percent mm -hmm. for the super wealthy uh, we're I, I believe in a totally so, yeah. different zone like mm -hmm. we're just sure. in a totally different zone from a public works perspective from an infrastructure perspective and what's important there and i'll get back to modernism in a second but like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what's important there is that culture needs to be re-understood in all of our imaginations as a crucial infrastructure in the united mm. states Mm. and therefore has to be met with the resources that other infrastructures are met with. Mm -hmm. Like I want culture to be part of the annual transportation bill because that's about infrastructure, right? right, right. Like I want a national ministry of culture. Right. Um, because we need to have ultimately a national conversation about what culture means mm -hmm. so that we can demand a rebalancing of the 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 of what is delivered to publics mm -hmm. through culture mm -hmm. based on the desires of the public and not just this kind of subset of wealthy individuals who support the arts and there's nothing wrong with those people they just mm -hmm. have a very particular point of view mm -hmm. it's just, you know it, it, it's just a very specific thing and mm -hmm. so to see more of us reflected in those cultural spaces we need the public to be supporting those cult those those cultural institutions in a more visible way more than just giving the tax write-off yeah i keep thinking about this story and i i actually I've been kind of lazy and I haven't actually looked it up, but there's a story of a town. I want to say it was, they, they, they pooled their resources and bought a football team. I think it was the Green Bay Packers, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, they got together and they said, no, 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 no. We, we're not going to let whomever, the oligarch, um, be the person who like buys this team and then owns the resources and then does just sleight of hand mm -hmm. uh, shenanigans to get the city to pay for a huge stadium. Um, um, they said, no, we're going to actually do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And they did. And I keep wondering about that as a model for ownership of essentially cultural institutions. Why? Why the, I keep wondering whether why that can't be repeated. Um, yeah. um, oh, so I want to I want to nail down a couple of things that you kind of said, and maybe I can say them more a little bit more explicitly. Yeah. So what you're talking about when you say talk about modernism, you're talking about an if I'm if please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Is an ideological construct that is inflected by a particular set of historical. developments so um the sort of the sort of um what's the word i'm looking for the sort of um accretion of money to a particular class um you mentioned in your book you quote i think it's uh, uh, uh ocasio cortez um yeah who says that every billionaire is a policy failure so you so so this ideological construct mm -hmm. uh we call you're calling modernism is inflected by this development of this billionaire class, donor class, as far as museums are concerned, um, donor class of wealthy individuals, and it's inflected by this mythos of the genius, genius artist, genius philanthropist, genius entrepreneur, genius curator, genius, 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 individual. And it always comes down to that sort of, um, that individual sort of um, rising above um, the collective and sort of leading the way out of the, the dark wilderness. And, and this amalgam of ideas, this ideological construct in, has something to do, you're saying, with 
how the museum gets structured in the modern realm. Like that, so yeah. we tend, so it so because of this, if I, if we if I follow the trail of breadcrumbs, museums tend to be hierarchical. Yes, and not only hierarchical, because this mm -hmm. is, I think, an important piece of the dysfunction, is that it is part of the job, for example, of the mm -hmm. museum director, because I've stood in those shoes, right? Mm -hmm. So part of my job was mm -hmm. to literally be that individual, that ah. like genius individual, yeah, the hero. to perform that role, mm -hmm. to raise the money, because I had to attract the people mm -hmm. who would say, ooh, she's one of those. Mm -hmm. She's one of those. Mm -hmm. And um, we should give her money. <laughs> her money. Yeah, because what I do as a philanthropist is right. I support the brilliant people who do good work. Right, right. right. I'm not saying I'm brilliant. I'm just saying I had to no, be I get perceived it. You, as you, you, you I had to, to play that role. As such, yeah, yeah, so that yeah. I could play the game, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and what I also had to do was to be able to. I had to translate, I had to translate this profoundly collective enterprise that was the museum mm. into individual successes. Right. Because that what it, that is what is valued by society. Right. And I think that is like the ultimate Marlboro man bullshit. Right. You know, that like I'm standing on the edge of a horse, I mean, I mean, an edge of a cliff on a horse, you know, probably I should have a penis too, but you know, whatever, we'll ignore the gender thing for a minute. But like, I'm sitting there and like looking out into the sunset, you know, like this is the image that people want to buy into, whether you're talking about an entrepreneur or, you know, and so to me, this is the precise collision of modernism and capitalism in the cultural realm. It's like, okay, this is what we need of our leadership because that's what it's going to, that's where we're going to see the vision, the right. vision, singular. Right, 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 right. So it's very difficult to even begin to see those things, never mind imagine what we would do alternatively. Um otherwise so so i used to say to people there was a point at which i should i dreamt of working in a museum and this is i think i disabused of this idea at some point working on the phd <laughs> um but before i did uh i, I mean i did work in museums as a docent mm -hmm. museum of latin american art actually in long beach california um but after working on the phd i definitely lost the taste for that. And what I used to say to people when they'd ask me why, is I'd say, I, I figured out that museum, most museums are fiefdoms. And you're, everyone is sort of, every lord and, lady, so, lord and lady sort of in service as a vassal to the like, to the king. And you sort of report to the king and say, you know, my liege, <laughs> we provided, <laughs> you know, this and this to the public. Like, and I'm not at all interested in that, at all. Um, and I don't think that you are either. I'm going to ask another question, if I may. Go ahead. OK, so on page 28, you say that I'm going to continue with this sort of enlightenment modernism theme. You say that, um, that as John Simmons points out in his extensive history of museums, Peel, quote, wholeheartedly embraced the enlightenment ideals of intellectual freedom and tolerance. Uh, and it occurred to me that um, you might not think that these are actually enlightenment ideals. And please tell me whether you do or not. But also on the tail end of that, are there any enlightenment ideals that we can see in the current iteration of the public museum that we should hold on to? Well, tolerance is a difficult one for me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm obvi. But, yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, what was the first one? Sorry. Uh, freedom. Freedom. Okay. So freedom, uh, freedom, I can, uh, freedom, I'm totally into. So, so I think, but I think that what um, perhaps the Enlightenment um, thinkers were imagining when that particular freedom was conditioned upon the oppression and colonization of other people. Mm. <laughs> and so, you know, mm. for me, enlightenment freedom is mm. different from 
I think the freedom and liberation struggles that um, that activists and have been fighting for um, for uh, for ages, mm -hmm. um, and because it's tuned not to the freedom of a small group of people to do whatever they want um, with only through the oppression of others, but mm -hmm. rather through uh, uh, an ideology of, of emancipation, of mutual emancipation. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think that's the part of the enlightenment piece that's really a problem for me is that those mm -hmm. rights of the enlightenment are not extended to literally all people. They are only extended to certain people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think once you stop fitting that definition of what that club was meant to represent, um, you weren't entitled to those rights. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, so that's where I falter with the enlightenment and then mm -hmm. the exclusions are just so great. It's like freedom. Yes, awesome. Let's hold on to that for dear but, life. But asterisk. But asterisk actually, right. like not that specific freedom because that specific freedom was meant for like rich white men of a certain class, of a certain educational background, of a certain ilk. And, um, you know, that's, that's all well and good, but can't we all have that mm. um, without, you know, without having to, um, or can we invent a different way of having that so that it doesn't rely upon um, slavery and colonization and extraction and, um, you know, basically killing the planet. Um, like, are there other ways that mutual liberation can be had? And can that be uh, something that we can model in cultural space? I mean, those are the, to me, those are the big questions, right? Right, so are there any enlightenment ideals that you see showing up in our current museums? Oh, do I see them showing up? Hell yeah. Um, you know, I think the study of the past is like a, a really specific enlightenment ideal. It's just that it's a very filtered past. Mm -hmm. It's what is in service of the status quo. And I think part of our beautiful challenge right now um, mm. is to imagine the types of storytelling that we can and should be doing that don't necessarily address those other uh, those those other long um, persistent um, you know stories um, what has been left out because of the the blindness of the bias mm -hmm. of the museum mm -hmm. what story, what richnesses can we then acc further accrete into mm -hmm. this space mm -hmm. um, perhaps, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I guess, you know, I haven't answered the question for myself, whether I think there is, you know, whether, I mean, I do, I guess I actually have, I mean, come on, I have. Um, sorry, I'm having a little conversation with myself for a second here because- Please carry on. You know, I, I do think that the museum has a place. Um, it, it, you know, I'm not one of, I, I, you know, Aruna and I, we were talking and, and, and she and Kelly were both like, well, we just need to burn it down. And, you know, and I, I actually don't believe that. I, I know you don't. I don't believe that. Right. That's part of why I wrote this book. I mm -hmm. think that the museum has had too many resources, intellectual, human, knowledge resources poured into it to just give up on it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it exists in so many different forms. Right. That I think that it's, it's not just salvageable, it's like essential, I guess. I, I would agree with that. And uh, you and I have talked about this before. You know, I've said in my book that I fundamentally believe that museums is uh, one, one of the few key institutions. There are not that many. I mean, public parks may be another, libraries maybe. Libraries, definitely. But museums are one of the few places where we subject personal experience to public debate, where we come together, not because we are members of the same family and not because we work together. Literally, we come together in a, a civic space, which really only exists in the spaces that cultural institutions make for that to exist, right? Like we come together, how do a group of strangers come to spend time with each other 
and lessen the distance between them as strangers. And museums are key to that, I would argue, until my dying day. Yes. Um, I do want to get to another question. Page 92. You, and this is going to be another irreverent one. So Good, go for it. Okay, great. So you say in talking about the sort of ways that institutions ham-fistedly deal with protests, you say, so perhaps insiders, art workers, directors, board members, public relations firms, and staff should read and respond to protests differently and see it as a useful mirror for collective self-reflection. Mm -hmm. Okay, real talk. Would you say the same thing to the Catholic League and Rudolph Giuliani when they were protesting the Chris Ophelia show at the Brooklyn Museum? Oh, good question. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I would want, I would, listen, I, I think that protest is really mm. important. Mm. I think it teaches us something about who we are and what we want out of whatever institution it is, whether mm. we're on the receiving end or on the giving end, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, I think that the um, the Giuliani situation, I think, probably sharpened a lot of museum workers, or I, I would imagine that it did. It mm. did to me as a, a cultural worker. I, I wasn't working in a museum then, but it, it sharpened my ideas about what um, what interference looks like, what mm. that censorship look like. Mm. So, you know, in a sense, that was a form of radical care. It was like showing to me what that actually meant. It, mm. did, it doesn't necessarily rely, my recommendation doesn't rely on it being like a positive influence, right? Um, it can sharpen your, your, your notions of the things you want to listen more closely to. Mm. But I think in the case of the more recent wave of protests, mm. where the protests were geared um, from a social justice angle, um, rather than a, rather than a, an ideological one, which the, the, the Giuliani ones were decidedly ideological in there. I, I would argue, Laura, that social justice concerns are just as ideological as anything else. Yeah, okay, you're right. Uh, that was a, maybe I used the wrong word there. I agree with you. Um, but I think that there is a, um, there's a reality um, that I think um, is based a historical reality in the kind of social justice concerns around racism, uh, around any form of um, kind of uh, bias in relation to um, to identity that I think is really important to hear. And, you know, I think part, I mean, from being inside of cultural spaces, you know, there are many people inside of cultural organizations who are part of the protests also, like this is not a mutually exclusive group. The Venn mm -hmm. diagram is overlapping, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but there are also people who aren't and they're completely outside of that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in this, in a similar way that you pointed out that, you know, in say the galleries, you might have a meeting of people who are strangers and who might not have, who might not have ever met Otherwise, I think on staffs of museums, especially really large museums where you have several hundred people working, yeah. you probably have people who would never have encountered one another. It's mm -hmm. not like they're all necessarily art lovers or whatever. Mm -hmm. I worked at the Guggenheim for three months. There were not necessarily all, you know, people who love to look at art. There were people who had just a job and that was their job. They worked at the Guggenheim, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so just to say like the assumption that there is uniformity on the interior of a cultural space also is erroneous. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that subtlety is really important in negotiating both what's happening inside mm -hmm. and what's happening outside. And I guess my feeling is that too many cultural spaces, especially when confronted in these mo with these moments of, you know, whether it's controversy or crisis wherever they may be framing it because mm. everybody feels precarious. I've never, I've worked in cultural museum 
cultural institutions that have like gobs of money compared to others and everyone still feels precarious I can tell you mm. Um, mm. so and that condition is permanent you mm. know? Um, because at the end of the day you have to raise all of your money every year unless you are lucky enough to have an endowment in which mm. case that throws off maybe if you're lucky 10 percent five percent 20 percent um so anyway i just feel like that piece of the puzzle is really important that when the controversy strikes that the first response isn't circle the wagons as mm -hmm. you know that that there is this kind of pause and this mm -hmm. is where i get into this idea of slowing down because mm -hmm. I think it's it's nerve-wracking it's it's I, i've been there it's like terrifying because mm -hmm. you know how hard your whole you and your whole team are working mm -hmm. to produce the cool stuff that you're producing for the public and it's all done you know very high you know in in a very generous uh, generously minded way mm -hmm. so you're terrified but at the same time like to resist in that moment mm -hmm. blocking Mm -hmm. just take a step back and be like what can i hear out of this what how can we hear this mm. how can we hear it and process it in a way mm. that isn't going to diminish anyone it's not about diminishing the protest or diminishing the work but just to hear what's actually being said because mm. i think you know that operates on a number of different levels and as i talk about in the book some of the most you know uh radical changes that have been happening in recent years for example with Warren Kanders at the Whitney mm -hmm. happened be not because there was one particular group protesting. It happened be because there were staffers who wrote a really important letter and mm -hmm. there, were, there were external protesters. There was really good, you know, reporting. I mean, by hyperallergic. Yeah, by yeah, hyperallergic. yeah. Like there, there were all these different layers and then the, the artists also played a role both in the protest, but, um, but also in, demanding that their work be withdrawn from the exhibition. So right. you had this kind of constellation of things mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. both coordinated and not coordinated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also important, you know, it's not always planable, right? right. This making. And so I think, I mean, to your to, to your question, I think you're right. It's like, I mean, I'm 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 gripping onto a very slippery slope, as it were, the slippery slopes of, of all of this conversation. But but I do think that there's like listening to be done when you have these um, these moments of, of crisis and controversy, either either to sharpen your resolve to resist whatever it is that's being demanded, or to perhaps make you more open to understanding what the institution could potentially be doing better. That's that's and very thoughtful that's a very thoughtful response i am tempted to ask you one more thing i've just been given the sign in the chat that we should be moving on to questions from the audience there are six so far and they all look rather substantial or i should say each looks rather substantial but i i can 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 i can i do this with you laura can, yeah. laura, can i can i ask you to just answer this the one last question for yeah. me um in like a minute and 30 seconds if you yes, can i'll go fast okay what do museums do really well um well that's a tough question um museums do research really well um museums do education work really well i concur um and um, I think museums also can organize the heck out of something. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they know how to use their infrastructure to make stuff happen. Mm -hmm. And so, and to that point, I think, I think that's where museums can be really useful mm. is because they know how to make stuff happen. They can realize something. They can take something from an idea to materializing it in space, and um, and I think that that's what's really really substantially important about the infrastructure piece. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start to take questions from our audience. Thank you, audience, for listening in. Thank you for engaging and participating in this kind of way, in this kind of muscular way.
Tom Richardson asks, can you talk about how you fell in love with museums and why you wanted to be part of one? And does that initial spark still live in you or have you become cynical or more hopeful about the museum and your place in it? Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, I and Seth for reading that. <laughs> so I, um, I fell in love with museums because my parents we we I grew up partially in the suburbs of New York City, and mm. you know usually once uh, once or twice a year we would you know drive into the cloisters around Christmas time, and just remembering like driving through the ramparts at Fort Tryon Park and mm. you know, and um, the kind of magic of being there, um, or you know zipping up those escalators at MoMA. I, I just I remember black white and red like it's just mm. it, like those the old MoMA escalators going from design to the surrealist galleries those were always my favorite um mm -hmm. you know I think I think there's this kind of push and pull and it's interesting because of this um work that I've been doing with the Brooklyn Public Library around um the um um art and society census work that we've been doing and kind of hearing from folks like what they um what they appreciate about museums and i think for me there's this kind of double-sided coin thing that happens with museums where it's like that moment of completely i did not expect to see that or what the heck is that that complete moment of like wonder and like what the hell mm -hmm. combined with some other times that moment of wow that reflects my experience in the world you know mm -hmm. and i think those two things whether one is challenging and one is more um uh, you know they can each operate in their own ways in very challenging ways or very uplifting ways or you know joyous ways and whatever or really difficult ways mm -hmm. of confronting realities mm -hmm. um, but i think the fact that museums and cultural spaces can evoke both of those things for me is magic like to for me sure. that's magic. so that's um i would say that's that's my answer to that question that's a very good answer dana marks asks what are some ideas that you have read or read about that can be implemented to affect radical equality of the viewer and i'm thinking of your interview here with maya chow i hope i'm pronouncing her name correctly Look at art, get paid in hypology. Okay, well, first of all, um, that project, Look at Art, Get Paid, is an amazing, incredible project that is ongoing in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and they continue mm -hmm. to do work um, in, in other cultural institutions. I know that things got a little wobbly with um, with COVID, but, but I believe that that is all you know, back on track or mm. re-emergingly on track. Um, but that that project is really brilliant in part because it actually seeks the advice. Oh, so let me th say what it is. It, Look at Art Get Paid was a project that was initiated by um, by two um, students um, at Brown um, in collaboration with um, with the RISD Museum of Art, and they brought uh, regular folks into the museum through advertisements in neighborhoods around uh, Providence, um, inviting regular folks to get paid to look at the literally look at art and look at the museum and provide feedback mm -hmm. about what they saw. Mm -hmm. And to me, what was important about that is that the fundamentally important piece of that project was actually acknowledging the knowledges and the thinking mm. of the public. Mm -hmm. Cultural institutions are trained as educators, right? The whole reason that the museum evolved in the United States the way that it did was largely as an educational component of the national project of mm -hmm. building the nation, right? Mm -hmm. And so their museums in the United States take their educational work very seriously, mm -hmm. perhaps to a point where they forget that their audiences actually have vast knowledges to contribute as well. Mm. And so in their attempts to constantly be broadcasting information and knowledge, there's been a kind of, in some, in some cases and in some circumstances, there is less exchange with the, with the public. 
Mm-hmm. And so what I thought was really important to look at about look at our get paid was it's it's kind of appreciation of that knowledge. And I think, you know, I think a lot of education departments across the United States have been quite focused on this exchange of knowledge for a very long time. This is mm. not I'm not, you know, this is not claiming some kind of but I think that if that that if more of that style of communication rather than this broadcast style of communication and the exchange, transmission model yeah yeah rather than this just transmission this one way channel radio thing mm-hmm. if it can be two way mm-hmm. I think that that might change certain people's re- you know relationship to that educational that 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 kind of very particular broadcasty educational vibe so I think um, I think to radically reimagine what that relationship is with the public you have to radically reimagine how you're communicating how your publics are communicating with you and as an institution and vice versa very very insightful Jesse Kaplan asks What three things can museums, libraries, and cultural institutions do right now to move forward more equitably? This is a great discussion. Thanks so much. I think you just kind of answered that. Yeah, but I want to say one more thing. Okay. There's another, because there's another thing. Slowing down, radically Mm. slowing down. I think Mm. cultural spaces are producing way too much in way too short a period of time. Mm. And what I really think is that slowing down allows all of us to take a little bit more time to think and to more importantly bring more people into the conversation like this whole idea of like who decides that's very narrow in part because of the timelines that we just put on stuff it's like well we have to decide tomorrow so i'll just be the decider you know (laughs) but maybe seth you and i should have lunch tomorrow and really talk it through because Mm. maybe that gets to a better decision Right. And I don't believe in this thing that committees make that bad decisions. I think that you actually have to listen to what people are saying and then collectively come up with decision making. I'm not saying that every exhibition needs to be curated by like in that mode, but I'm just yeah. saying like there are ways to think before you act that where a collective discussion is going to really add value. So I just want to add that slowing down. Thing. Yes, and I think that that's, um, I'm glad that you did. Rachel Duplessis is posing a question. Assuming that universities are a crucial part of the cultural infrastructure, are there any lessons from the way universities reconfigured fields and could do so again, such as black or racial studies, gender studies, et cetera, that is these fields where we can fr- reconfigure it off in the studies. So is, there, is there a lesson, and she puts lesson in quotes, for museums about, this is a well-chosen word, sclerotic departments or intellectual division, dis- divisions that should be made new or renewed? Well, I think here and here, I think that that's an important uh, lesson. Um, mm. And I think that it exists in a slightly different form, right? Mm-hmm. I think it exists in the form of the culturally specific institution. Um, you know, Leslie Lohman being a queer art museum, mm-hmm. um, you know, the Studio Museum in Harlem. I think culturally specific organizations perform, I think, that function that that um i'm sorry i forgot the person's name because it just rachel duplessis that's okay that rachel brought up you Mm -hmm. know and i think that that's really important i think you know i think that i think universal museums are Mm. much tougher nuts to crack i think Mm. there's a whole kind of um a different mode of thinking and i think that a lot more work has to be done on the universal museum because i think that's a much more difficult ball of wax Mm -hmm. um you know Mm -hmm. even the fact that i'm calling it the universal museum is really a problem (laughs) yeah you mean (laughs) universal survey museum essentially survey museum like which is which which is modeled on the louvre right which are all coming out of this like grand european tradition of capturing capturing the cultures of the planet in one building so obviously there are problems with that especially when you have looted art i mean we could spend hours but but just to say like i think 
the, the rethinking and the kind of delving more deeply, I think it comes from this desire to tell more stories, right? Mm -hmm. That the stories that have been allowed have been the stories that reinforce the status quo. So mm -hmm. how do we make more space um, in our cultural spaces to tell the stories that have not been allowed, right? And mm -hmm. how do we and how do we do that in a capable and thoughtful way, mm -hmm. um, and not in a knee-jerk way, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. James Dunbar is the next to last question, the penultimate question. Museums have been sites of protest and occupation due to their commodification and production of art for an elite art market only available to the ultra wealthy. Okay, that's not the question part yet. That's just an assertion, but okay, we're, we're with you. Can museums be a site of institutional critique which situates the production for the market and the hyper commodification of art while also expanding the discussion to those beyond the museum goer. I'm gonna just jump in here a little bit, Laura, if, yeah. if you don't mind, and say, I'm not sure that museums need to be a site of institutional critique because they've already kind of figured yeah. out how to absorb institutional critique. That's exactly what I was going to say is that, right. you know, a prime example of that, actually, we can talk about Warren Candors again, mm. um, is the piece that um, forensic architecture made uh, with Laura Poitras and Praxis Films for mm. the biennial, um, mm. uh, the so-called tear gas biennial. Mm. Um, and, you know, that was an in-depth dismantling or investigation into Warren Kander's business um, of supplying tear gas um, across the world, really, but particularly in Ferguson at the border, where it was used against asylum seekers in the United States mm. um, and in Palestine. And I mm. think, you know, um, I think that the way, I mean, I think that that project, I have, I, I love forensic architecture and what they do. I think they have a brilliant art practice. And I think situating that in the midst of the biennial did something. It did something very specific. Mm -hmm. um, it, well, first of all, it functioned as a film that was educational. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. um, it also functioned to disrupt the, the kind of, clean narrative of the um, supporter of the museum, um, you know, existing in the same plane as this art object that was also um, disruptive to his, uh, disrupt the art object was itself disruptive to the, to the trustees narrative of their support of the museum, right? Precisely. And what that was meant to do from a, right. um, yeah, right. um, from a structural perspective. And then it also triggered the, triggered the looking around at what structures underlay the mm -hmm. museum. Mm -hmm. But it also said, well, the museum is after all showing it, so maybe it's okay. You know, so maybe it all kind of works out in the end because they're Precisely. being self-critical. Right. And I think that the where that gets picked up again is when the staff writes the letter and when the protests happen and when when all of these other things get layered on top of a gesture of artwork being included in a biennial mm -hmm. because that was a brave curatorial decision to make to go to the director of the museum and be like hey we're this is the work we're putting in for forensic architecture and mm -hmm. then the director had to deal with that however he did mm -hmm. and I, I am certain that that was not a happy conversation with Warren Kanders about, mm -hmm. uh, about that work. I'm sure mm -hmm. that he protested mm -hmm. um, to its inclusion, but, but on a certain level, here's where the museum can claim neutrality where it maybe shouldn't, mm -hmm. where as the director, if I, were, if I were the director of the Whitney, I could say, well, you know, Mr. Sanders, uh, Kanders, um, you know, we have to respect the freedom of speech of the artist. You know, this is what they're thinking. It's not necessarily the opinion of the museum. And the freedom of speech, essentially, of the curators, because they're the ones who are saying we're selecting this work because we think it is it's important. It's the work yes. of American art and right. our job as the curators of the biennial are to put right. Important works of American art in the museum, mm. and this is our job, right? Precisely, precisely. But it is not necessarily a reflection of what we 
personally think or what the museum judges to your company called Safari Land, you know, we don't necessarily, you know, have that judgment. And look, I have no idea what the conversation actually was, but I've definitely been tempted to use that excuse when mm -hmm. I've had a wealthy individual who I who supported the institution that I was working for object to something that we were showing. Well, mm -hmm. you know, but it's actually not a good way out. Hmm. It's actually not, you need to do the work of saying mm -hmm. as, as a leader of the institution, mm -hmm. actually this is important work because yes, it's an important work of American art and that's what the point of the biennial is and that's why we're showing it. But it's also an important reflection of what reality is mm. you know? and, and to have that tough conversation. I mean, I think that, you know, as museum directors, we don't necessarily get off the hook for that, even though it can be really difficult and we may, you know, endanger potentially losing a donor over it, you know? Well, I could totally see a donor pushing back saying, well, what are museums, why are museums suddenly all that invested in reality. In, in fact, like it's it, it uh, the history of mark making and and the related disciplines. Anything that we call the arts really has more to do with our imaginative capacities, our, our ability to dream, to move beyond our just uh, in some cases ugly, just brutish reality. But I think it also is equally important going back to the two sides of the coin that I fell in love with of mm. seeing our realities reflected in cultural space. Mm. And I think that will forever be a part of what what cultural space does is that it reflects mm. our individual or, or collective realities and whether that then inspires work like the Surrealists or a work of great imagination that brings us into a nightmare zone or a joyous zone or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. I think both exist simultaneously mm -hmm. and that, 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 that confronting those realities through art is a very important part of collective, um, collective life. I mean, understanding or even, you know, because all of our realities obviously are not the same. And so, you know, how that, that gets negotiated, as you were saying in the beginning, between strangers in a public space, uh, not an unpoliced public space, but a public space nonetheless, in that civic space, we have to negotiate that space together. And so how we do that in relationship to what that work is telling us about my reality or your reality or somebody else's reality, I think that that is a prime location for what, what museum work needs to address. For sure, um, and we are in agreement on that. There's one last question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you again, Laura, if you don't mind, to be rather succinct in your response sure. uh, because we've got like, well, we actually have zero minutes left. But I want to uh, honor Bonnie Harper Zedek's question, which is what kind of museums do we need that you don't presently see? Oh boy. Um, I think that um, I want to see more slow museums that really mm. take um, care for mm. the people who work in them, mm -hmm. for the people who make the culture that's being shown mm -hmm. in them, yeah. and, and for the people who visit them. Mm -hmm care for those existences mm. in a really profound way. And I don't know what that means or what that necessarily looks like. Um, and I think certain institutions are doing it beautifully. Um, you know, so a lot of smaller institutions that I love. Mm. Um, and also some that aren't institutions even. We were just talking about the Sugar Hill ice cream shop in Harlem, which is an ice cream shop, but <laughs> really is making is doing amazing cultural work. So, you know, I think um, I think there there's a lot to be invented, and For sure. uh, we're just at a lucky moment right now where we get to try everything because there's so much that's messed up. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, we're kind of clawing our way back or clawing our way towards clarity, um, maybe an inch at a time. Thank you, Laura. 
Thank you to Andy Cahan from the Philadelphia Free um, Library. And thanks to Julia Judge at Virtual Books who helped to put this event together and put Laura, Laura and I in conversation. And thanks for all our listeners. Uh, we really appreciate you being as engaged as you have been clearly in this conversation. And um, of course, thank you, Laura, for being who you are. And um, I've been Seth Rodney. It's been my distinct pleasure to talk with you tonight. Good night. Thank you so much, Seth. It's been, as always, such a pleasure to hang out, spend time, and share ideas. Okay. Thank you, Free Library. <laughs>